All right, guys, uh, we've covered chapter seven. We went through a bunch of ionic uh, compounds and we're definitely not gonna leave that for good, but we're gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna give you this video to look at over break and I'm gonna put some links to other videos that I think might help clarify things if I didn't do a very good job. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about molecular compounds. We've got, we covered ionic compounds in chapter seven. This is chapter eight, molecular compounds. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be bringing in chapter nine, which is the naming portion of it. Um, I already brought in the naming portion of chapter seven. Now I'm gonna bring in the naming portion into chapter eight so we can both understand what a covalent compound is or a molecular compound is and um, how to name them. You notice I keep using the term molecular or covalent. Those, you, those names can be used interchangeably uh, and you'll see why in just a minute. So here's some definitions I'd like you to write down. Uh, so pause the, the video and write them down. So covalent bonding is between um, two atoms, two or more atoms. It's the smallest piece, the smallest piece of a covalently bonded compound is called a molecule. So if, re, if you recall in the ionic compounds, we had formula units. That was the lowest whole number ratio. In covalent bonding or molecular bonding, there's a thing called a molecule. It is not the lowest whole number ratio. It is just the, the correct number of things. For example, um, C6H11O6 is sucrose, fructose, galactose, one of those sugars, the, the monosaccharides. Clearly, um, that one happens to be the lowest whole number ratio because of the 11. Um, but there are some other molecules that are that could certainly be reduced to lower um, numbers and we can't do that because the molecules are entities in the uh, in, entities in and of themselves they're not just a ratio of of things stuck together like ionic compounds are they are a total number of things stuck together that make up something unique and uh, I'll try to get that point across to you. But for example, look at water here to the, the lower left. It's not a whole bunch of H's and O's attracted to each other through electrostatic forces like ionic bonding is. Each water is just completely individual. It is just two hydrogens and one oxygen. And it's not, it has no relationship to any other hydrogens or oxygens. Whereas sodium chloride is a whole bunch of sodiums intermingled with chlorides to make this matrix, this three-dimensional matrix or, or crystal. And covalents are not necessarily crystals. So we call this the smallest unit the molecule. So here we have a picture of three molecules. When we're talking about covalent bonding and molecular bonding, what we're really talking about is how the electrons are being used. And electrons in covalent or molecular bonding are shared. So it's kind of like if you and your, your sibling had to share a car. Um, hopefully you share it equally, everybody's happy, but really neither one is happy. But if someone asks you on the street, hey, do you have a car? You'd say, yeah, I've got a car. You may or may not admit that you share it with your brother or sister, but you say, yeah, I've got a car. So the idea here is they're sharing electrons um, and it allows them to feel like they have full valence shells. And I'll go into that in a bit. Um, they don't take them though. They've got to give them back on occasion. So we'll talk about the difference between equal sharing and unequal sharing, but that's going to be in a, in a subsequent video. So here we have three molecules. These diagrams that you see here are called space filling diagrams, and they kind of give us an idea of what we think the exterior, in other words, the, the electron shells look like from a distance. Um, we don't know exactly because as I've shown to you before, we really can't image them much closer than uh, I showed you. But based on mathematical models and stuff, we think this is how they look because they're sharing electrons. So the electrons, so these would be the, like the electron clouds would be, you know, in this general shape. And, you know, as you can see, water is kind of a funky shape. looks kind of like an upside down Mickey Mouse or a right side up Mickey Mouse, depending on where you're looking at it. And carbon dioxide has got, uh, it's a linear shape, and then ammonia is a different shape too. And so we're gonna get to the point where we can predict the shape 
uh, based on what's attached to the central atom, and the central atom being the one in the middle. Okay, so we will uh, we'll go through that. So we need to understand uh, covalent bonding is um, it's where the electronegativity difference between the elements is less than two. Um, and if you recall, electronegativity is all about the ability to attract an electron. And if if you're a metal, you don't have the ability to attract an electron to any great extent, but you're happy to give it up. And the nonmetal really wants it. So if you were taking, say, sodium and chloride, there's a big electronegativity difference in it. And so chlorine is going to get the electron, and sodium is going to say, ah, no biggie, I gave up, that's fine. So you end up with your, your ionic compound, sodium plus and Cl minus. So when you have two things that are closer in electronegativity, and I'll show you a chart in just a second, they are not going to, one's not going to steal the electron from the other. It's kind of like you and your sibling sharing a car. You, as much as you would love to have the car all your own, um, your parents are going to say no. So you have to share. And so when you're, when you are somewhat equal, in other words, the difference between your ability to, to get the car is about the same, you're going to share it. So it's, um, you can't steal it. You're going to have to share it. And it's between nonmetals and nonmetals for covalent bonding always. And because they tend to all nonmetals all tend to make negative charges, you can't have the charge be what holds them together, because negatives don't attract negatives. So consequently, you can't figure the, the, use the charge to figure out how many. Like the crossing the charges helps us figure out how many atoms uh, are connected together in a an ionic compound. So here's the chart I was telling you about. By the way, this is a European chart. So these every place you see a comma, that's really what we, you and I would consider a decimal place. Um, but and, and the the general numbers are not that big a deal. But in the previous slide, it said difference less than two. So if I look at these nonmetals up here from from boron, now now silicon's a it's a metalloid. Um, and we, but we still kind of can think, consider some of these that are the metalloids, we can consider them as, as nonmetals in terms of bonding. Um, so if I'm looking at that, if I look at boron and fluorine, they are just at the edge of being able to covalently bond because fluorine is, is much higher in electronegativity. It's probably going to grab the electrons and keep them more, but it is going to share. Hydrogen is another one. And remember, hydrogen is a non-metal. It's the only non-metal that, that kind of doesn't fit with all the other places, all the non, other non-metals. And so it's um, it's in the wrong place on the periodic table for this particular analysis, but it has an um, electronegativity of 2.1. So when we're looking at these things and saying, hey, look, if I have nitrogen and oxygen bonding together, yeah, that's less than two. So again, it's it's covalent or molecular. But if I look at, say, aluminum and nitrogen, you say, well, wait, that's only 1.5 um, difference. So they shouldn't bond uh, ionically. They should bond covalently. But aluminum is a metal. And so we're talking about nonmetals and nonmetals whose electronegativities are between are, are less than two. Okay. So again, this these electronegativities between aluminum and nitro, nitrogen are less than two, but it's a metal and a nonmetal. So aluminum, because it's a metal, would be happy to give up its electron. We'll go into this in more detail, so you don't have to memorize anything about this. I just want you to understand that we're really talking about these. Um, we're really talking about these uh, elements over here. We're talking about these, okay, the nonmetals. And we're talking about um, sharing electrons rather than taking electrons. Okay, so molecular formula, that's just what we're talking about. So we had formula units for ionic compounds. We have molecular formulas for covalent compounds. And a molecular formula just shows you, just like it does in an ionic compound, how many elements of each type are in the, how many atoms of each type are in the um, in the molecule. So as you know, the, the two here for water says there are two hydrogens and only one oxygen. Carbon dioxide is one carbon, two oxygens. Um, ethanol is two carbons, six hydrogens, and one, uh, one uh, oxygen. And um, 
by the way, this is a common name. This is these are this is a con, or this is a, uh, a formal name, and this is a common name. Um, so we'll get into the naming too. But the whole idea is that that H two O is a certain molecule, and as we said before, H two O two is a different molecule. And if I had a whole bunch of H two O, it's not going to make something different. It's just going to be water, just a lot lot of it. Okay. Um, so the nature of covalent bonding, the octet rule is normally followed, except for hydrogen, helium, and lith you know, lithium is not going to covalently bond, but hydrogen, for example, um, it needs only two electrons to meet what we'd say the octet rule. It only has an, a 1s orbital, um, so therefore it only has, it can only fit up to two electrons in that, uh, that orbital to feel like helium. So um, it meets the octet rule. So this octet rule is really for everything groups or uh, periods two and below. So two through seven. Um, but for the first period, we talk about two electrons meeting the, the need. So single covalent bond or a single bond is when two atoms share one pair of electrons. So I've got two individual electrons. I have two hydrogen atoms, each has their own electron. Well, to make a hydrogen molecule, H2, they share the, the molecule or the electrons. So this little line right here indicates two electrons. Okay. So that's a hydrogen molecule. It's the smallest. It happens to be also the element. As I said, there are those uh, diatomic elements. There's hydrogen. Um, Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, chlorine, iodine. Those are all the, the diatomic molecules. So di meaning two. Um, so they bond with themselves. And they make single, or double, or triple bonds, depending which ones we're talking about. And we'll, we'll go through that in a minute. So let's compare and contrast a little bit between ionic and covalent. Ionic, we talked about repeating three-dimensional patterns of positive and negative atoms or ions. And here we've got sodium metal and chlorine. And then the sodium gives up its electron so that we have a chloride ion and a sodium ion. They are electrostatically attracted. So we've got the electron that's stolen. You got high electronegativity difference. It's between a metal and a nonmetal as I except for NH4 plus. Uh, it forms a crystal structure. And it's proportional. So you have 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 5 to 1, whatever it is. You've got this, this ratio of um, cation to anion and so on. And it's, again, a repeating pattern in multiple dimensions. In ionic compounds, as you guys know, we, we use the charge to determine how many of it. We, we cross the charges and we figure out how much. Uh, it's like if I have um, potassium sulfate. It, you know, the, the charge on the sulfate tells me that I need two potassiums. And so I know exactly how many of each I need in terms of ratio. So it's always going to be two to one, but it could be two million to one million, but it's two to one. Okay. In, in molecular compounds, the formal name tells you the number of atoms. So like ionic compounds, the second part of all the names end with ide. So as we talked about sodium chloride, well, we still use the ide. But now we use prefixes to indicate the number of each atom. So here are the prefixes. So please write these down. Oops. So mono, di, tri, tetra. That's one that's always a tough one because a lot of us, especially those of us that, that have tried speaking or do speak uh, the Romance languages, you think of quattro or, or four in that respect. But tetra is the other one. And then pentagram. You know, like pentagon, pentagram, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, and deca. There are more uh, prefixes, but not that we have to worry about. Because we're only going to be explaining relatively small molecules. So the naming convention, you write down the prefix. In other words, how many of the first atom is there, there is. The name of the atom. Then the prefix for the second atom, in other words, how many of the second atom there are, the name of the second atom with the name change, back name changed to ide. And there you go. So like um, 
dihydrogen monoxide, H2O, di for two hydrogens, dihydrogen monoxide, because there's one oxygen. So again, it's dihydrogen monoxide. So there are a couple of rules on the naming. Uh, we tend to not write the word mono for the first one. So we wouldn't say, um, we don't say mono carbon monoxide. We just get rid of that. We just say carbon monoxide. Okay. So we don't use mono for the first element if it's one of them. We also don't try to, we try not to use double vowels. So you notice how I said monoxide instead of monoxide. Um, I say tetroxide rather than tetraoxide. Um, and again, it kind of makes for weird spelling, but I, I'm not going to grade you on spelling. I'm going to grade you on intent. But so like I said, it's tetroxide when it's O4. Okay, so something to think about as you're doing these. But let's take a look at some. So let's take a look at N2O. So you've got two nitrogens. That'd be di. So di nitrogen. So you say the whole word, di nitrogen monoxide. Di nitrogen monoxide. The second one is one N. So it's because the rule says we don't say mono, it's not mon, mono nitrogen dioxide. It's just nitrogen dioxide. But now we have two in the second one, so it's dichlorine. It's not dichloride because this isn't the end. It's the beginning. So dichlorine heptoxide. And here we've got carbon, only one of them, so we don't say mono, just carbon tetrabromide. Carbon dioxide, which I think you guys are all familiar with. And here's the one I usually try to trick people up at school, but we're not live. So take a look at this. You should recognize, wait, 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 wait. Barium is not a nonmetal. Barium is a metal. Therefore, this is ionic. So we say barium chloride. We do not say the dye. So it's barium chloride. This too is implied uh, because we know this is a plus two and a minus two, or you know, two minus ones. Um, we don't need to say dye. So guys, I can't tell you how many times I've caught people when we have a test and I have asked them to explain why this is named the way it is and people can't remember to separate these. Covalent, prefixes. Ionic, no prefix. Okay? And then, again, I said that this is dihydrogen monoxide. But if you have a, a common name like water, just use it. Um, so just important to know these. Okay, so going back the other direction, diphosphorus, so that's P2O5. See, di is 2, penta is 5, so P2O5. Okay, tetraiodine, so iodine is I, tetra is 4, and we have one oxygen, I4O. Um, sulfur, hexafluoride, so that's one sulfur and six fluorines. We've got um, nitrogen and trioxide. We've got carbon by itself again because it doesn't say mono, but it's, it's just carbon. Tetrahydride, so that's CH4. Phosphorus, trifluoride, so F3. Uh, and here's another one. Oops, I tried to sneak another one in there on you. Aluminum is a metal. So it is still AlCl3 because I've got a plus 3 and a minus 1. And so I need to cross my charges. But again, that is your ionic thing. Okay, so I'm going to now... Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to stop this, but before I do, I want you to pay attention. I've got some links that I'm going to be putting into the assignment. If any of this is not making sense to you, or if you want to move ahead a little bit, if you want to 
get a bigger picture of it, feel free to watch some of these videos. Um, you're going to have the whole break to do so. I highly recommend you uh, also go back and review things that are still not making sense so that we feel comfortable moving forward. Thanks.